Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Roche. Greetings and welcome to this program titled Maximizing the Heart Failure Pre-Discharge Toolkit, the Utility of Natriuretic Peptide Biomarker Assessment. I am Dr. Javed Butler, Professor and Chairman of the Department of Medicine at University of Mississippi in Jackson, Mississippi. Absolutely delighted to be doing this program with two of my friends, colleagues, and highly uh, knowledgeable in the field of both biomarkers and heart failure. I have with me today Dr. Beth Davidson, who's the Director for the Center for Advanced Heart Failure Therapy at the Centennial Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee, and Dr. James Genuzzi, who's a Hutter Family Professor of Medicine at the Mass General Hospital at Harvard Medical School. So welcome both. Thanks very much, Javid. Good to be with you. Thank you very much. Today, we plan to have a 360 look at the use of biomarkers, specifically natriuretic peptides in the management of patients admitted to the hospital with decompensated heart failure or worsening heart failure in general, and discuss other applications of natriuretic peptides. So we intend to cover prognostic implications of natriuretic uh, peptide biomarkers as assessment as part of the pre-discharge planning for our patients, recommendations for pre-discharge natriuretic peptide biomarker utilization, and how to apply these biomarkers in the practical setting. So with that said, let's move on with the program. Uh, so Beth, let me let me start with you just to put the whole con, you know, the, the, the program in perspective. Certainly. So we know that the landscape of heart failure has changed a lot over the last few years. And the good news is we have more medical therapies, we have more devices, we've expanded the patient populations to include our health HEF PEF population, but that also makes the complexity of care higher. So it's more complicated on top of a progressive chronic condition. We know that heart failure is at epidemic proportions, currently 6 million Americans, and by 2030, we're expecting 80 million Americans, partly due to our baby boomers and aging population. And the risk for heart failure is that one in five will develop it in their lifetime. Also, we know that, you know, as the number of patients go up, the costs associated with these patients are going to go up. It's going to be a parallel rise. And it's expected by uh, 2030 that it may cost $70 billion to manage this population. We know that heart failure hospital, hospitalization means that patients are doing poorly. It's a marker of risk. It's a time to stop and think about what we're doing because what you've been doing isn't working any longer. It's the number one reason our Medicare pay population gets admitted to the hospital and despite the penalties from CMS or the Affordable Care Act, we've had no significant decline in our 30-day readmission rates. So we still have residual morbidity and mortality risk despite these things that we're throwing at patients. So it's really, I think, a call to action. What, what can we do differently to risk stratify these patients, improve their outcomes, and try to keep them out of the hospital and at home? So great. So, so, so Jim, let me come to you. So when you see a patient in a hospital set, setting, uh, granted a uh, common disease, granted high-risk disease, uh, can we do something to change the trajectory of the disease process? What, what, what are the goals when you, when you see these patients and how to manage them? Yeah, you know, it's important to recognize that, that things do not just begin and end at the hospitalization. Heart failure is a, a continuum that um, may first present in the hospital, but there's a story after discharge, and often these patients get readmitted and then get discharged again. And so rather than considering the hospitalization in isolation from the entire journey, 
um, there's developed a real sense of, of um, consensus around the fact that the heart failure hospitalization, <clears throat> while on the one hand representing a high risk um, pivotal moment in the disease, also represents an ideal moment to optimize care. And the only way we're going to optimize care is if we understand these patients better. So what I mean, what I mean by that, without going too far into it, is understanding why the heart failure decompensated, understand whether there are things that we need to do to better manage the heart failure risks in these individuals, treating underlying ischemic heart disease, treating risk factors, including cardiometabolic disease and renal disease. Um, uh, making sure that we adequately decongest patients, because I'll remind everyone, of course, that, um, that heart failure hospitalization, generally, um, the trigger is congestion. So understanding <clears throat> the adequacy of decongestion. The American College of Cardiology has an outstanding expert consensus decision pathway document where it talks about something called a trajectory check which is to follow our patient's um, treatment in the hospital to ensure <clears throat> that we have adequately decongested them, that we have um, started to uh, improve symptoms, but then not stopping there. The other really important thing that consensus has developed around is once decongestion has, be, has um, been effective is to assess the oral medication regimen these patients are taking and establish a, a, a strong guideline directed medical therapy plan for these individuals such that um, once they are discharged home, it may be continued. And indeed, the European Society of Cardiology recently suggested initiation, for example, of SGLT2 inhibitors in hospitalized individuals with heart failure as an example of starting an outpatient medication with the goal to optimize the transition to the outpatient setting. Great. So, so let me let me come back to you, Beth. So you know the, the challenge here is that you know if you have a heart attack, you go to the CCU. If you have a stroke, you go to the neuro unit. Uh, these patients, uh, you know, the care is becoming complex, as you mentioned. But the risks are high. Uh, yet these patients are sort of you know uh, treated across different specialties, across different floors in a hospital. Uh, which sort of begs the question, how do you systematize their care? So can you tell us about the whole discharge planning process and using that as an opportunity to make sure that everybody gets the appropriate care? And, and importantly, uh, are, are all the patients the same? Is there a way we can classify their risk and, and how to approach that? Yeah, we've known for a long time that discharge planning is critically important, right? I think the first time I saw that in the guidelines was back in 2013, where there was actually a section on discharge planning. And we started talking about terms like care coordination and transitions of care. I think sort of in the most simplistic terms, if you step back and think about what does discharge planning really mean, it means, you know, we're looking for an effective, comprehensive, well-communicated discharge plan. And we know if we have that, then we can expect better outcomes. And also if we have this patient-centered approach, then that will improve patient satisfaction, quality of life, and enhance their self-care as well. And as we've alluded, it's really challenging and especially important in this heart failure population is they have complex, multiple comorbid conditions. I can't think of a single patient who has heart failure in a silo, right? So there's actually been studies that have shown that an, an, an effective discharge plan can reduce hospitalization and improve mortality rates. So, that, so that's thorough, clear communications across disciplines and across settings. So you think about that circle of care. I think sometimes when people think about transitions of care, they just think about, okay, my patient has gone from ICU to step down to home. That is true, but a transition of care is also, you know, I've got general cardiologist, I've got a heart failure specialist, I've got my diabetes specialist, and I've got my renal uh, professionals as well. So multifaceted, very, very complex. So we know that that comprehensive discharge plan includes a lot of things. We have to teach patients about self-care and self-monitoring, lifestyle modification, dietary restrictions, obviously, which are very hard for patients, activity, 
And then we want to give them specific plans for discharge follow up. Uh, one of my pet peeves is, you know, looking at a discharge note that says, contact your provider for follow up in two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. That doesn't work. Patients need to know where they're going, what time to be there, how to get there, and who they're seeing. So it truly is a team effort, I think, across all disciplines, physicians, APPs, nurses, respiratory therapists, don't forget our pharmacist and our nutritionist um, to help us develop this strategy so we are all on the same page trying to move the patient forward like Dr. Januzzi suggested. You've got the hospital period, but this post-discharge period is very vulnerable and it's going to take all of us in this concerted effort to make that as smooth as possible for the patient. So, Jim, so can you uh, uh, give us a, a short primer uh, for some of our colleagues who may not think about natural peptides all the, all the time, because there's still some confusion about NT-pro-BNP versus BNP, just, just, just the biology. We'll come to the clinical uses in a minute, but just some, some biological insights. Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, I love the fact that this, um, this program is focused on acute heart failure and the role of natriuretic peptides, but what I particularly like is that we opened up with the most important aspect here, which is clinical assessment. <clears throat> That's the, the, the goal of this whole process, is to best assess our patients with respect to their diagnosis, the adequacy of um, decongestion after treatment, and also residual risk, which is also part of discharge planning and assessment, because that informs your follow-up plan to some extent. And so you're absolutely right, Dr. Davidson, you know, <clears throat> nothing gets me more annoyed than the call your doctor for an appointment in four weeks, which often doesn't happen. One of the reasons why starting meds in the hospital is so important. But <clears throat> if you knew that someone needed to be seen rather urgently because their residual risk was still very high versus someone who could be scheduled for a transitions appointment in two to four weeks, for example. Sorting them out on an individual basis is something where biomarkers may actually be of some use. And so um, with that in mind, just a quick reminder about biology. I, I won't you know, get too, um, too complicated with respect to BNP versus NT pro BNP. Much of what I'm going to say is interchangeable with respect to the acute heart failure setting. We can talk about differences in the outpatient setting, but when a person is congested, I'll remind everyone that natriuretic peptides are largely driven by transmural wall stress. Therefore, therefore, in the hospital, when someone comes in with very markedly elevated natriuretic peptide values, what's driving those values generally is mostly volume overload. I will remind you, and this is a tie-in for when we talk about the office, however, that cardiac structure and function, including left ventricular size and function, right ventricular size and function, pressures, atrial size, rhythm, valve disease, all of those factors matter. It's just that the, the, the signal that we're detecting in the hospital is largely driven by congestion. So there are irrefutable data showing that higher values of BNP or NT pro BNP when someone presents with shortness of breath really well identifies congestion and acute heart failure, particularly with the more market elevations of BNP over 500 and NT pro BNP over an age adjusted value. So for an elder over uh, 1,800, these values are quite strikingly associated with decompensated failure. The bigger question, however, we'll get to is, you know, to the extent that both BNP and NT pro BNP show a rather rapid decline after decongestion, uh, when and how they might be used to assess risk at the time of discharge. In other words, can they be helpful to judge whether we've done our job? So that's, that's great. That puts a lot of things in perspective. So Beth, let me come to you now. So what exactly are our guidelines saying in terms of the use of natriuretic peptides in these patients? Yeah, I, you know, I mentioned that 2013 guidelines, um, you know, they really had one nice chart that talked about hospital discharge and all the things that we needed to do. And at the very last little bullet, back in 2013, we said you should use biomarkers, natriuretic peptides to identify patients at high risk. And pretty much that's what it said. 
So uh, fast forward to 2017, and we actually got the focused update which really expanded the use of biomarkers for us. And I, and I think Dr. Januzzi um, has been integral in, in all these clinical trials that have showed ways to use this, you know, different utility for use of natriuretic peptides. So now we have different guidelines that say, you know, for using natriuretic peptides and biomarkers for diagnosis and prognosis, that's a 1A recommendation going back to that pre-discharge risk assessment that we were talking about, um, that Dr. Januzzi was just mentioning, that's a 2A recommendation. And then prevention, you know, looking at those stage A patients, I think that was the STOP HF trial, and how to guide medical therapy once patients are on some of these drugs, that's also a 2A recommendation. So they're now, it's much more ingrained now, I think, in our clinical practice, and we're really beginning to understand the utility and, and how to use these to first, you know, what patients are highest at risk? Do we have patients on the right drugs and the right doses? And if they're not responding, what do we need to do about them? And then maybe, you know, where biggest bang for the buck is, I think what we'd all like to do is prevent people from developing heart failure to begin with. And now we sort of have different buckets to think about how to use our biomarkers and natriuretic peptides. Great. So, so we have some tools. They are recommended. And it uh, seems like that this is the high-risk population. And whatever tools we can use to improve the patient's outcomes are necessary. So, Jim, let tell us practically how to use natriuretic peptides. Yeah, what wonderful way of framing it up. And, and once again, you, you know, <clears throat> the way that Dr. Davidson you know, portrayed this as a as a transition from the emergency department all the way to the first office visit and beyond is so important because biomarkers are agnostic to where they're measured. In other words, you can use them in the office, you can use them in the ER, and to an extent, you can build a story around what you're seeing in the same patient as you measure them. Everyone's numbers are a little different. And so it's really important to recognize that each patient is unique with respect to the patterns that they may show. But to, to start the story in the emergency department, that's generally when congestion is maximal. High values, once again, are strongly associated with the presence of decompensated heart failure. We've shown this in numerous clinical trials now, and it's a uh, value add to clinical judgment, particularly when there's ambiguity in the presentation. That's how the guideline is written. Um, so diagnosis, as uh, Dr. Davidson said, class 1A. In addition, Early on, we showed that the emergency department draw uh, for natriuretic peptide was strongly prognostic as well. But what was interesting is that subsequent data came out showing that in the course of decongestion, especially effective decongestion, reduction during hospitalization in NT pro BNP or BNP was even stronger a predictor of subsequent outcomes than the, the admission value. So what we now recommend is a baseline value for diagnosis and triaging decision making, and then do what we should do best, which is take care of the patient, assess the risks, treat the patient, establish a GDMT program, and let our clinical judgment drive the management until a person appears ready for discharge. At that moment, a second measurement of NT pro BNP or BNP is now recommended with a class 2A level in the guidelines to evaluate for an adequate reduction. So what do we consider an adequate reduction? Once again, driven by decongestion, an adequate reduction would be a, a, a fall of 30% or more during the hospitalization. Now, sometimes patients don't have a baseline value. And so um, looking at the absolute pre-discharge value is also really helpful. So if you have someone you don't have an admitting concentration of BNP or NT pro BNP, aiming for a value below for NT pro BNP, at least below 4,000, but lower is always better. In fact, in one study out of Europe, the lowest risk group was an NT pro BNP below 1,500. So if you can get them down that far, wonderful. For BNP, it would be less than about 350 at discharge, nominally speaking. 
But importantly, as we you know have already made uh, the point many times, this is just a transition from hospital to home. And so what we do at the Mass General Heart Center and other institutions have started doing as well is looking at the pre-discharge value and then deciding in part on how that may inform the intensity and the rapidity of follow-up, right? So if someone hasn't declined very much or if they've risen, those are people we may often keep in the hospital a little longer and adjust their therapies. For people who've had a good reduction but remain somewhat elevated, they're at high risk for re repeat hospitalization and probably merit the kind of urgent within seven day follow-up, we call it a CUN7 type approach to ensure that the, the trajectory continues in a favorable direction. And ultimately, once again, as I opened up with, biomarkers don't know where they're being measured. And so, you know, if the person's discharge value is 4,000, you see them in the office a week later and it's now 2,500, that tells you something about their improving trajectory. And then pivots us now to the outpatient setting where biomarkers actually tell us a somewhat different story, but nonetheless, a valuable story with respect to both risk assessment and management. So, so this is very, very helpful. So, so thank you very much for that. So, so let me ask you another question. So can you give us some idea? Uh, is high NT pro BNP always heart failure? Is uh, lower NT pro BNP always not heart failure? Some idea about, you know, some pearls on false positive, false negative, or, or, or should we even use the word false, like other differential? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> these, these markers are released by the heart. They're not falsely elevated or falsely low. It's really false relative to our own expectations of what we're looking at, right? Our perceptions. So um, in particular, it's hard to fake an elevated natriuretic peptide. The question is, why is it elevated? There's been a lot of incorrect belief that, for example, chronic kidney disease may cause an NT pro BMP to be elevated in the absence of heart failure. Generally speaking, although both BNP and NT pro BMP have a small amount of dependence on the kidneys for their clearance, this is a real elevation in these patients. And whether it's associated with decompensated failure or just an overall cardiorenal risk picture, you know, that's what we need to, def de um, to define at the bedside, right? And, and that sort of, I think, speaks to the, the fact that with, as with any diagnostic study, you need to understand the differential diagnosis for an abnormal result, whether it's a chest X-ray, a coronary angiogram, or a blood test. Understanding the differential diagnosis for an elevated natriuretic peptide in the absence of decompensated heart failure is important. So um, atrial fibrillation is a common one. Um, pulmonary hypertension, states where the heart is strained outside of left heart congestion um, are, are, you know, is sort of the, the bottom line. For lower values, uh, that's a really sort of, you know, thorny subject because, you know, um, we need to define what low really means. If I measured an NT pro BNP or in you or in Dr. Davidson, I mean, it would be 20, 15, you know? So if somebody has got an NT pro BNP of 200, that's not normal. There's nothing normal about that. It's just that we use cutoffs that are based on large studies where this is the optimal threshold, but there are some individuals with heart failure whose values are lower. So what are those circumstances? Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, smaller left ventricular chamber size, therefore lower wall stress, generally lower natriuretic peptide values. But all the rules hold. Higher is worse, lower is better, dropping um, concentrations are favorable. Obesity, for reasons that nobody really quite understands, but the data are now pointing towards an obesity-mediated suppression of BNP gene transcription and translation. People that are at the higher body mass index categories, which in, in all three of our regions we see, right? I mean, every single day, um, uh, being with a, with a BMI over 30 increases your risk for a natriuretic peptide that is um, falsely low by about 20%. But what does falsely low mean? It means that it's not normal, but it's not above the threshold value for calling positive. So again, I ask our viewers to look at the number and look at it, not just with respect to positive negative, but quantitatively what the number may be.
So, so I, I just want to probe one question. So you mentioned about half ref and half pef and, and why in half pef the, the levels will be low, but I just want to, you, you mentioned it, but I want to really underscore and highlight this. In terms of the management utility, you would use it in both half ref and half pef patients, nitritic peptide? Great question. So um, the, the data are overwhelmingly clear <clears throat> that among individuals with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, concentrations of NT pro BNP are as uh, a, um, are about as strongly prognostic as any other tool that we use. Stated in a more simple way, yes, I use it in half pef because it is strongly prognostic in these patients. Okay, now we are focused on acute heart failure, but I also want to completely take advantage of you being with us today. So one last question. Not acute heart failure, not first visit, but now chronic heart failure, not hospitalized, or uh, hospitalization was six months ago. Uh, can you tell us about the use of nitritic peptides for managing patients and for optimizing therapy? Yeah, I will keep it brief, but basically make the point that everything is reversed now with respect to what drives natriuretic peptide values. In the office, congestion is important, but transmural wall stress, the driver of natriuretic peptides, um, may, may be much more strongly associated in that scenario with structural heart disease severity, whether it's heart muscle disease, whether it's valve disease. And so we and others have shown quite um, strongly that um, longitudinally measured NT pro BNP is strongly associated with cardiac remodeling. So in reduced EF, strongly associated with changes in ejection fraction and volumes. In preserved EF, strongly associated with wall thickness, LV mass, and atrial size and pressure. What this means is that longitudinal measurement in the office is not only prognostic, it is, we know this, but it's telling you something about the heart structure and function, as well, of course, as the degree of congestion to some extent. This therefore means you can use these markers to help judge your longitudinal trajectory in the office as well. Understanding the stability of certain individuals, such as someone with a well-suppressed NT pro BNP below 1,000 in the office, a BNP under 100 or 150. These are folks that are at very low risk for decompensation generally, very low risk for progressive forward deleterious remodeling. And therefore, you know, these are folks that you can focus on um, the, the things we should, lifestyle, medications, et cetera, but without getting too over the top crazy with imaging and other types of advanced testing, as long as they're feeling well. It's the individuals with the rising value, those with market elevations that you cannot bring down, that we should be bringing our full force of care to, because these are the highest risk individuals who are most likely to have decompensation and circle back and end up in the hospital. Dr. Genuzzi, thinking about this ambulatory care uh, patient, one thing that you might want to highlight that I get a lot of questions about, you know, heart failure clinics, we use Secubitril Valsartan all the time, but, but I think uh, sometimes people are confused about why does BNP go up, but NT pro BNP doesn't go up. So maybe just mentioning that for our listeners as well would be helpful. So absolutely. And thanks, Dr. Davidson. So, so <clears throat> we too get this question a lot. And these observations that you bring up are really important, which is that um, guideline directed medical therapy actually lowers prognostic biomarkers in parallel with their benefits. So we showed, for example, that treatment with Secubitril Valsartan causes a reduction in NT pro BNP and troponin, high sensitivity troponin, in proportion to the reverse remodeling, the improvement in the ejection fraction in these people. So it's a great barometer for assessing response to therapy. The key, however, is you have to understand the biology of the marker and the treatment that you're giving. And the one that you just mentioned, the intersection between Secubitril Valsartan and BNP, not NT pro BNP, is important. This is because BNP is degraded by neprilysin. Neprilysin is inhibited by Secubitril Valsartan. So although for most drugs, you expect a reduction in BNP when a, a therapy is doing a good thing, when you're treated with Secubitril Valsartan, most of the time, you don't see a huge increase. We just published data from HF showing that the, there was no real increase, but it doesn't go down. 
an NT pro BMP does in this situation. And so with that in mind, clinicians really should remember that there's more to it than just simply prescribing a drug and looking at the biomarker. You have to remember these little nuances. I always try to explain it as the action of the drug versus the effect of the, of the therapy. And, and, and then the light bulb sort of comes on, but it's important for, for clinicians to remember that. No, no question. And that's a really great way of thinking it. I've used, you know, blood glucose and hemoglobin A1C as another example, you know, longer acting, shorter acting. But in this case, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. It's effect of the drug and, and monitoring benefit of the drug. And, um, and with that in mind, it's important also to reassure your colleagues that over time, the BNP typically does fall as the patient's improving and there's less BNP around for the drug to, to pro, um, propagate its lifespan. And so, uh, you know, generally speaking, over a few months, the BNP tends to fall as well. And if it doesn't, and they're non-responders, and you have them on good medical therapy at reasonable or high doses, and if they're not in a, an advanced heart failure clinic or disease management program, you need to consider that. It goes back to sort of the, I need help. These are patients who are non-responders. These are patients who are in trouble. Yeah, no question, Beth. We worked on this exactly on the expert consensus decision pathway document that focused on this exact piece, which is how can you tell when someone's not doing well? And I need help is such a, a great acronym because it summarizes it. And at least for the purposes of this talk, the, the N in I need help is natriuretic peptides being elevated. You know, it is, it is always such an incredible pleasure to, uh, to, to, to talk to the two of you, and, and I always end up learning something. And trust me, I'll be using this action-reaction business uh, in my own practice as well. But I cannot thank you enough for all the knowledge and uh, insights that you have given us. Uh, and I hope that it is of significant value to our listeners and their patients as well. So thank you, Jim. Thank you, Beth, so much for all your uh, insights. And thank you for our audience members for participating in this activity. Also, uh, please proceed to answer the post-activity assessment questions to receive credit. And please take a moment to complete the program evaluation. It really helps us in improving the future programs. Thank you so much.